Well, howdy, folks, and welcome to the first ever episode of the Rancher Podcast. I'm your host, Austin Halverson, and I want to start off by thanking you for checking out this podcast, and I hope to bring you history of the Western lifestyle and stories from the American West for a new generation of podcast listeners. History has always been a passion of mine, and I felt that this was great to not only learn more about the history myself, but an incredible opportunity to share those stories with others. So I hope you view this podcast as more of a dialogue than a lecture series. I want to hear from you. I want to hear your stories um, and your experiences, and of course, whatever you want to hear more about. So I've set up the email address, which is rancherpodcast at gmail.com. Again, rancherpodcast, all combined, at gmail.com to feel that input. And I would encourage you all to reach out. You can also follow my Instagram page, which is The Rancher Pod. Again, that is at The Rancher Pod. Or my Facebook page, which is The Rancher. And I would really encourage you to give those pages a follow. I post a lot of content on there. Um, And also, if you have any old historical photos or anything of your family competing in Western events such as rodeo or horse shows, Um, I really would love if you would send that to me because I would post it on my page and it's a great way to share um, the history of our, you know, great way of life. But today, for the inaugural episode, I would like to cover a topic that is near and dear to my heart, and that is the creation and the history of the American Quarter Horse breed. The American Quarter Horse gets its name because it's truly an American innovation designed for Americans by Americans. So we'll get more into that right after a message from our sponsors. I'm proud to have Elite Ranch Consulting as one of the first sponsors of the Rancher Podcast. Elite Ranch Consulting is your one-stop shop for protecting your real estate investment. Whether you inherited a piece of land bought a ranch as your vacation home, or are simply looking to maximize the land you already own, Elite Ranch Consulting's team of experts can help you make the right decisions to make your land profitable. Visit EliteRanchConsulting.com today to learn more about how they can help you protect your American dream. Now, the best way to describe an American quarter horse is, I think, honestly, in car terms. I think of the quarter horse as kind of an SUV. You know, it's rugged, it's mid-sized, and it can pull a load if necessary, and it's really just utilitarian. Um, It does everything you expect from a car and most of the things you expect from a truck. Uh, So it's, it's a great middle ground, and that's why it has become the most common horse in the world today. The American Quarter Horse Association says that there are more than 3 million horses registered currently, and it is the largest breed association in the world. Now, there is some contention on that. They say that there are probably more thoroughbreds in the world, um, but there is no centralized registry for those horses. So the American Quarter Horse is, uh, Association is, in fact, the largest breed association in the world. Um, and I plan on covering the history of the association itself in a future episode, but today is all about the horse. So let's get into it. Now, When we think about the American Quarter Horse breed, it was really developed in the 17th and 18th centuries of the American colonies on the Atlantic coast. But that's not really where the story starts. Although there is evidence that the early ancestors of the modern horse did actually come from the North American continent, by the time the Spanish explorers made it to the New World, there hadn't actually been a horse here for thousands of years. And, you know, the migratory patterns of these animals along with the Ice Ages and whatnot, really uh, led to there not being any horses here. So I know that uh, we really have this idea of the horse being part of the American West, but that did not come to uh, fruition until much later than, um, you know, the time of the Spanish even. So by the time they had come, there were no horses here, but they brought their own. And these horses that were called Iberian horses... You might have also heard of them uh, as the Spanish Barb, um, were named for the peninsula, the Iberian Peninsula, that Portugal and Spain inhabit. And they brought them with them to the New World in the 15th century. So again, when you think about uh, famous explorers like Columbus, Cortez, uh, Coronado, all of these folks brought 
these Iberian horses with them. And these horses were really a, a interesting uh, breed. They were small enough that by today's standards, we would probably consider them ponies. And uh, that was really useful because they were able to uh, transport them on their ships. And along with that, they were the very strong and were war, war horses. So, um, you know, when you think about the Mongolian tradition of the, the war horse that's small and agile and something you could easily shoot a bow off of, uh, that's where these horses came from because the Mongolians under Genghis Khan uh, took over the entire Eurasian continent uh, hundreds of years earlier and kind of left these horses as uh, their gift to the world. Um, but their small stature also made them easier to transport on the ships, like I said, for these very, very long journeys. Um, and along with the primitive guns that the Spanish had, it led to a very swift and mer merciless subjugation of any of the tribes they encountered. Now again, just think about, if you are a Native American, you have no mode of uh, transportation outside of your own two feet. Perhaps if you're on the water, then you've got canoes or whatnot. But really, it would be impossible to successfully mount a war unless you were in a strongly fortified position that could stop the Spanish and their, their horses. You know, we think about the, the Germans and the Blitzkrieg in the World Wars, how they were able to successfully utilize the railroads and also newer things like cars, tanks, and motorcycles, and they just moved at a breakneck speed. Now, that's exactly what the Spanish did. They just overpowered the Native Americans simply due to the fact that they had uh, quicker, faster transportation. So the Spanish really quickly recognized that advantage, and they worked very hard to keep the horses out of the hands of their new subjects because they did not want to lose that advantage. So for almost 200 years, the Spanish kept their loss of horses to a very small minimum. It was rare to hear of any horses escaping, but that actually all changed in 1680. The Pueblo tribe, which is in modern-day New Mexico, revolted against Spanish rule and killed hundreds of Spanish soldiers and ultimately pushed the rest of the settlers that were in that area out of the region. And when the Spanish left, they actually left behind around 1,500 horses. And that forever changed the lives of the Native Americans. Because unlike the Spanish, the Pueblo tribe was very happy to trade with other tribes across the country. Uh, you know, when you think about horses, you probably don't really think about the Pueblo tribe. You think about another one, which were the Comanches. The Comanches was a tribe that was native to the southern plains of modern-day Texas and were really the first ones to truly master the use of the horse and ultimately became a major conqueror in that area and also an agitator to other tribes and white settlers alike. Now, obviously, again, modernization and technology would ultimately bring down the Comanches. When Samuel Colt invented the revolver more than 100 years later, uh, you know, that advantage that the Comanches had, the ability to fire bows and arrows super fast while horseback, uh, was no longer an advantage. But the feral horse population also began to grow at this time, and more horses were escaping from the tribes and setting off on their own into the vast plains and deserts than had ever happened during the Spanish rule. And, you know, you think about the Pueblo tribe was not the great horse tribe. Uh, that was the Comanches. But the Pueblos did actually uh, become fairly wealthy due to their trade of horses. And we saw throughout the next couple hundred years that the Pueblos became very wealthy, they herded sheep, they had agriculture, um, and really were more of a sedentary agrarian tribe than what we had seen before then because they were able to make money and uh, become wealthy off these horses. Um, but people wouldn't start calling these horses that escaped Mustangs uh, until probably the 1800s because these horses that were leaving and escaping um, were, you know, just another uh, fear or concern for the... Uh, 
So even though the Pueblos were making money off these horses, uh, they did continue to let some of them escape. And, you know, we started calling them Mustangs in around the 1800s, these wild horses, uh, which that word actually came from the word for wild grazers that the Spanish used, which was Mustangle. And uh, essentially, like words like alligator, which is a Spanish word, alegado, that became bastardized by English-speaking settlers, uh, we got the word Mustang. So now that we've gone over one side of the equation, if you will, of what created the American Quarter Horse, let's go to the other side, which is kind of the English-Arabian side of this equation. So just like we saw with the 15th uh, century or 15th through 16th century, um, on, in the 1600s or the 17th century, uh, we also saw the creation of the European colonies throughout the American continent. And more and more horses were becoming uh, in just incredibly useful tools in the taming of the wild land for farming and settlements throughout the American colonies. So by the 1660s, co colonists had plenty of horses and a little bit of time on their hands, and they decided to race horses, just as they had in the old country. And... Uh, the British settlers, you know, began bringing these beautiful, tall, slender horses from the Arabian Peninsula to breed for the racing by the end of the 1600s as well. And the thoroughbred breed in America was built on three stallions. And those three stallions have uh, pretty interesting names, you know, the Byerly Turk, the Godolphin Arabian, and the Darley Arabian. And, uh, you know, these names sound very pretentious, but it, it turns out that these names come from their owners. So the Byerly Turk means that a Mr. Byerly owned a Turkish horse. So you would say, you know, hey, that's the Byerly's Turk. The next one, the Godolphin Arabian, was owned by a Mr. Godolphin. And, of course, the Darley Arabian was owned by a Mr. Darley. Uh, so regardless, though, the thoroughbreds would click, quickly come to the United States and... It was recorded that the first likely thoroughbred to America was Bully Rock, who was a stallion that arrived in 1730. And he was the son of the Darley Arabian, and his mother was actually a Byerly Turk mare. So he, uh, twofold, was part of this uh, founding sire uh, group. But he was the son of the Darley Arabian, and he was brought to Virginia by a man named Samuel Gist. And, uh, you know, we'll actually get more into this story in another podcast. It's a very interesting one, so uh, be sure to check that one out. But what essentially happened was that they started breeding Bully Rock and other horses to the American stock, which consisted of these Spanish ponies and also the English warm-blooded horses. So, uh, you know, you think about the Irish hobby horse, uh, these other types of horses that are a little bit bigger and uh, stockier and kind of more draft horses and when you take that and you combine it with the thoroughbred plus the spanish pony you're going to get this kind of average height average weight horse that's kind of a you know dynamic utilitarian horse and that's where the quarter horse came from so uh, another important horse in this story came about in 1752 when another wealthy Virginian named John Randolph imported a grandson of the Godolphin Arabian, and his name was Janus. Now in Roman mythology, Janus is the god of beginnings and transitions, and this horse would really surely live up to that name because Janus became the great granddaddy of the, of the horse that we call the American Quarter Horse by imparting the genetic traits into his offspring that made them the incredible sprinters that we appreciate today. Although he himself was a long distance race runner, these traits proved to be the perfect thing to cross with the quicker horses that the Native Americans had been breeding. So many of you listeners surely already know the name of the quarter horse and where origin of the name quarter horse. And um, it's a really interesting one. You know, when I was little, I always figured that it just meant that they were better than a nickel and dime pony. But apparently my kid logic was a little flawed. The name actually comes from the significant sprinting speed of the quarter horse. They are kind of the king of the short race and could beat any other breed at a quarter mile. So think about a 100 meter dash versus the 10,000 meter run. They take completely different types of athletes. You know, 
uh, Usain Bolt could be a quarter horse, whereas Elliot Kipchoge, who wins the marathons all the time, is more of a thoroughbred, essentially. And I, I know that, you know, there is some contention that, of course, some thoroughbreds are faster than some quarter horses at a quarter mile. But overall, in general, if you take that bell curve, it is typically a fact that the American quarter horse, especially the ones bred for racing, are uh, going to be faster than the average thoroughbred at a quarter mile. So while the thoroughbred and its royal heritage became increasingly popular in high society, both in England and in the burgeoning cities of the American East Coast, the American quarter horse was winning the hearts and minds of the common man, both in the cities and on the frontier. The quarter horse was faster, more entertaining, more useful, and more attainable. And you know, there's actually a very interesting grad student's paper that I, I wish I could find this uh, person who wrote it. And they wrote a paper called A Peculiar Di uh, Diversion. And it's talking about the quarter horse racing of the backwater colonies and uh, states of the United States uh, around the 17 and 1800s. And basically it was talking about how uh, the quarter horse and their races were much more approachable for the average person. You could show up with your family, have a, a great day at a thoroughbred track, you know, eat the great food, spend all the money, wear the lavish clothing, whatnot. Or you could walk down the street and two men might have just agreed that they were going to meet at 2 p.m. at a certain place and race and there would be wagering and all kinds of stuff and the beer would be flowing and it was just a completely different atmosphere, you know. Uh, I, yeah, I, I guess you could say it was kind of like the difference between a NASCAR race and a Formula One race. You know, there's not very many yachts pulling up to uh, spectate at the NASCAR races, although there are quite a lot of wealthy people that watch NASCAR races. It's just a different type of crowd. It's more accessible, especially to us Americans. So uh, the breed's mutt status uh, in its infancy meant that it did not hold the same provenance as the hot-blooded cousins like the thoroughbreds. And uh, the quarter horse was really, you know, making a name for itself, uh, almost like a drag racer, you know, and um, we'll get into the positives of the thoroughbreds in a future episode, but today this is all about core horses, and the thoroughbreds make a really good foil to this story, so um, please, you know, understand I'm not going to continue to rag on thoroughbreds forever, but I do like to uh, compare and contrast them uh, throughout history. It's a good way to get a better understanding of the American quarter horse. So let's go to the West and what um, role the, the horse had in the West. So when it moved with settlers in the 1800s, the crossbreed that was the American quarter horse was actually further crossed with the wild Mustangs that we described earlier. And those were descended from that Spanish stock and these hardy animals made the quarter horse even more rugged with while the sprinting speed actually remained. And uh, just a small anecdote, I was privileged to grow up riding quite a few great rope horses. And I had one named Six Pack um, who was a true cow horse. And when we talk about cow horses, uh, you know, these are horses that really just because of the way the horses are bred, they have what we call cow sense. Um, and he was really just automatic when it came to herding the steers back to the chute for another round of team roping. And he would even sometimes bite a stubborn steer right on the base of the tail just to get them moving again. So having witnessed this firsthand, I can tell you that it is an amazing trait and it's one that is really wonderful to watch. And it's kind of like the first time you see a bird dog point. Um, you know, it's that same level of just innate sense that you know that this thing is going to help you get through whatever work you need done. So the next great milestone in the quarter horse's history would be the year 1844. And that was the year that the legendary horse Steel Dust arrived in Texas. And he was every bit the quarter horse ideal. He was lightning fast, and, you know, in fact, he was so fast that there was a story that a jockey claimed he had to cover Steel Dust's back in molasses just to stay on. And I haven't been able to verify that anywhere, 
uh, which, you know, it sounds like an old country saying, but, you know, plenty of people rubber band themselves into the saddle these days, and I'm sure that that would be laughed at at some time in the future. Uh, but anyways, Steel Dust was also hardworking off the track. Uh, he had that desirable cow sense, and every Western horseman wanted a horse like Steel, Bus, or Steel Dust. So the Bay Stud was able to instill these traits in his offspring, just as, just as Janus had given his speed. So Steel Dust's reputation was really built on an 1853 match race in McKinney, Texas, where he beat a horse named Monmouth outright. And uh, he became one of the most desired studs in the country. And throughout the late 1800s, there were prominent quarter horse studs that continued to move into Texas. These studs included Shiloh, Lox Rondo, Old Cold Deck, Traveler, and others that, you know, were pretty much deserving of their own standalone podcast someday. So be looking for that as well. But the quarter horse became such a dominant force in the West because of the hybrid vigor that many breeders call it. The crossing of the graceful and athletic horses of the Arabian origin with the tougher and sturdier horses of the Western United States made for an animal that was suited to the various tasks of frontier life. Little stories outside of pedigrees exist, though, from the 1880s through the early 1900s for the quarter horse. And, you know, the fact is is that uh, the quarter horse was just putting in reliable work on the farm. He didn't have time to, uh, you know, be building his uh, pedigree and reputation uh, as a racer or a competitor because uh, this horse was really, again, a workhorse. Um, So much of the interesting stories from this time actually come from the big ranches. You know, the Four Sixes, the Wagner, the King, and other ranches, they became standard bearers for the breed. And, you know, their cowboys needed these reliable companions for managing the large herds on these operations. Um, But, you know, formal horse racing actually continued to be dominated by thoroughbreds throughout this time as well. And... Uh, the good thing for the quarter horse, though, was that there was a new equestrian event that was beginning to grow out of the cattle ranges of the West. And this was one that was going to be dominated by quarter horses. And that sport was rodeo. You see, these cowboys had been showing off their talents for as long as they had existed. And they would gamble with their range partners about who had the best skills in and out of the saddle. But in the 1880s, these cowboys got the chance to show off in front of a captive audience and more importantly they got cash prizes and of course when money was on the line these cowboys wanted to ensure they were on the best mounts available so the sport of rodeo led to even more interest in the value of the quarter horses genetics because these lines were beginning to be evaluated not only on their speed but on the necessary traits such as cow sense that help to perform in rodeo events they needed to be muscular on top of speed and they needed to be trainable So, this really brought a renaissance to the American Quarter Horse. And, you know, that leads us into the next part. I I know I'm going to have plenty of podcasts in the future about rodeos and the history of rodeo. uh, But from the 1880s and 90s on through the 1930s, uh, rodeo was a huge sport. And uh, it's, you know, got a very colorful history But I think the best place to end this podcast is where I plan to begin another podcast, and that is with the formation of the American Quarter Horse Association. You see, associations with their own set of standards had begun popping up throughout the early 1900s. And just like with dogs and other domesticated animals, being able to claim that pure breed would lead to an increased value in your stock. So quarter horse breeders were kind of dismayed that they had not had such a standard by which to market their horses because, you know, creating a breed is not just about, um, you know, protecting the value of your assets or whatnot. That's an important part, but it also uh, brings people together and it creates better bloodlines because um, if everyone is just trying to breed to one horse because they know that that horse is um you know a quality that they want then you you really kind of limit the gene pool uh of horses in general so when you bring in 
the idea of the quarter horse breed, you can say, well, you know, this one might not be specifically a wimpy um, offspring, but it's in that same line. It's a Poco Bueno or it's a, a Leo or a King. You know, uh, these horses that are similar uh, and have common lineage but are not the exact same. So uh, what happened was quite a handful of people were instrumental in the inspiration and creation of the association and a lot of them are going to get their own episode but there was one man in particular that was enamored by this gym of the west and his name was robert denhart he was then a faculty member at the greatest university the world has ever seen texas a m and i know i'm not biased at all and he was introduced to what were called at the time actually steel dust and you know there is a small association uh, still around today called uh, the steel dust association which uh, you know, really values types of the type of horse that Steel Dust uh, created, but he, you know, Denhart was introduced to these horses by none other than the famous literary figure J. Frank Doby, and so throughout the 1930s, Denhart started writing about the American Quarter Horse and what made it so special to him, and so when he did that, he really. Uh, helped kind of lay the groundwork for what would become the standard that was so desired in the American Quarter Horse. And so Denhart had been making that case to breeders um, and he decided that it was time to create an association. So in March of 1940 at the Fort Worth Stock Show, Denhart brought together about 75 breeders and owners to formally create the American Quarter Horse Association. And this certainly isn't the end of the story when it comes to the founding of what is now the largest registry in the world. There were going to be countless discussions about what constituted a quarter horse. And you know, some of those conversations still happen today. However, a month later in 1940, the minutes reflect that there was the decision made to define the quarter horse as follows. And it said, all quarter horses must be able to run a quarter mile in 23 seconds or show that they are capable of quarter horse performance under ranch conditions. And let me tell you, the vagueness of that bare bones definition became the basis for a decade's worth of division and debate. But again, that's a story for another time. So that's all I have for you today. I really thank you for joining me. And uh, I hope you'll come back to the Rancher Podcast to learn more about this true American treasure. And if you have any input, or requests for the future episodes or any questions, please reach me at rancherpodcast at gmail.com or you can contact me through Instagram at the Rancher Pod or through Facebook on the Rancher Podcast page. So thank you all, God bless, and Godspeed.